and welcome to U.S. Law Shield Live. I'm independent program attorney Richard Hayes. And I'm independent program attorney Emily Taylor. Today we are talking about traveling with your firearms. Now, this is a live presentation. Obviously, it'll be available for rebroadcast. You might be watching it then. But we are taking live questions. So if you have a question about traveling with a firearm, transporting firearms, paste it in the comments section or leave it in the comment section because we, we go through all these and that's where we draw a lot of these discussions from. So make sure to leave a comment. But we're taking live questions right now. It's early. If you leave a comment, there's a good chance we're going to get to it. Uh, but but you know, before we get started, make sure to hit the like button. If you haven't subscribed already, make sure to subscribe. And let's start talking about traveling with your firearms, Emily. The first question, and these were sourced from a previous discussion. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to go through the old questions, get to the new questions that people have. Let's talk about traveling across state lines with a firearm, just generally. Generally, um, can you do it? And so we're going to have to decide, actually, when we talk about whether or not it's legal to travel with that firearm across state lines, what method you're using to travel. Are you flying? Are you driving? Are you taking a train? Um, and not only that, but where are you going? Because, um, unfortunately, we don't have national reciprocity. We don't have some sort of nationwide guideline about where you can carry those firearms, what's legal. So we have to put together this patchwork of a 50-state framework with a couple federal protections thrown in there here and there to see if it's actually a legal possibility. And I think that's uh, that'll be our meat and potatoes here breaking down today. Yes, and for, for those of you, if if you're wondering about you know a specific state's law um, in the description of this video there is a guide for travel guide for gun owners so make sure to follow that link check out that travel guide it'll have a lot of specifics about the the states in particular because you know while we're licensed in the state of texas and we're going to be talking about national laws mm -hmm. with traveling uh, these guides have some really great stuff in it they have carry charts of where you can and cannot carry right you know what you need to do if you're talking to law enforcement it's going to have yeah. all the specifics for that particular can state. i carry out a parade in louisiana <laughs> right? right i mean the weird stuff yeah it's it, in there exactly yeah. right and it goes to and and this kind of leads into what what you were saying originally is you know the laws of the 50 states are not uniform exactly um so we have no real I mean, other than learning the law ahead of time, we yes. have no real protection or legal guidance for you. You've got to do your research. Um, you've got to find a really solid source for that research because the internet message board contains Lord knows what. No, so. exactly right. And I think that brings up kind of the first, um, kind of the first part about you know what law applies to you when you are traveling. And uh, you know, it sounds like a simple question. I'm sure a lot of people know the answer to it. But just as a refresher. The law in which you're located applies. So, you know, let's say you're a Florida resident and you're visiting Georgia. You know, while you are present in the state of Georgia, Georgia's law is going to apply to you. So maybe you couldn't conceal carry in the state of Florida. They don't, or that you couldn't open carry. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. They don't have open carry in Florida. In Georgia, maybe you could open carry. And so that, that you know, even though your license says a concealed deadly weapons license, you know, you might be allowed to open carry in the state of Georgia. So the law in the state that you're located, and I'm going to jump into this live question right now because it fits in perfect. David asks, if I'm driving through multiple states with different gun laws, do we have to pull over in each state and change the location of the firearm or how we're carrying it in the car? And what do you say to that? Emily? Yeah. So, I mean, the answer is... Um Maybe, right? right? But generally, there is a federal protection that's going to stop you from having to do that. Um, but I, you know, I will say, um, you know, we talk to license holders quite a bit. I mean, probably the easiest way to drive and carry is by having a license or permit from your home state and then, you know, plotting your route to be sure that you are driving through states in which that license is recognized. Even then, you've got maybe some maneuvering to do state by state, but hopefully not. Um, however, we do have the federal safe passage provision, which will protect you in those sort of intermediate states if your license is not recognized. Do you want to talk through the specifics yes. there? So under 18 U.S.C. 926A, we have the Federal Safe Passage Provision of the Firearms Owners Protection Act. And it gives us kind of three qualifications that if you meet, you may have some added protections while traveling with a firearm. Now, the first and foremost is that the firearm is unloaded, encased and locked up or inaccessible. So mm -hmm. that's kind of the first big one. The second one, and I'll have you, um, or I'll have you talk about the third one. The second one is that you have a legal start, 
and legal end. You know, where you um, where you start, you could legally possess the firearms and ammunition. Where you end, you could legally possess the firearms or ammunition. And so let me give a couple of examples of that oh, yeah. first because, you know, we get this question a lot. So let's say you're going from Florida to Maine. You know, you could legally possess a handgun in both of those states. But we know we're passing through a bunch of states that just do not like the Second Amendment. They don't want you to have a firearm. And so when we talk about legal start and legal finish, we're not saying you have to start, you know, Florida and drive all the way to Maine without stopping and, you know, potentially hurt somebody by falling asleep at the wheel. You know, where you stop, let's say you stop in Pennsylvania, that would mm -hmm. become your new starting destination. So let's say you go Florida, Pennsylvania, you stop. Pennsylvania is your new starting destination. Pennsylvania to Maine, you know, th that would be your legal start and legal finish. And the third one, this is what I want you to talk about is traveling because that's where that's where there's a big gray area. Yes, yeah, so you cannot cease traveling right. in order to receive this federal protection. Right. And when you do cease traveling, you have created for yourself a new stop and a new start, right? You're, yeah. You've created for yourself a new destination. So let's take your Florida example, Florida to Maine. Um, you know, if you are stopping that travel for anything more then probably, and I say probably because we don't have good case law on this because it just varies wildly from state to state. Um, if you do anything more than stop for, let's say, um, a trip to the restroom or maybe to get gas for your car, you have potentially, and the conservative legal advice here is, assume that you have ceased traveling. So, um, you know, when you are, let's say, you know, you're going up from Florida, you're probably okay in the vast majority of states to spend the night, to go maybe take a little side trip, to yeah. tour something. Um, but yeah, you know, Pennsylvania, that's a great stop. Don't stop for that overnight trip or to do a little sightseeing in New York or New Jersey. Yeah. Because if you do that, you've ceased traveling, you've lost your federal protection while you're in that state, and you've created for yourself essentially a new starting destination or a new stopping destination. You've just, you've lost that great federal protection. Um, and I say great federal protection, we can talk about this in a little bit more detail, but for the most part, it is, I mean, it it's a law that's on the books, but you take those states like New York and New Jersey, and let's say that you have, you've not ceased traveling, you're just trying to book it through the state of New Jersey as quickly as humanly possible without speeding and breaking the law so that you know you're going to get that safe passage provision, you're otherwise in compliance with the law. If you get pulled over by that New Jersey law enforcement officer, they very well may say, okay, you're trying to take advantage of this federal law, that's great. That's an affirmative defense. So yeah. I'm going to arrest you. I'm going to haul you back here. You're going to have to show up in court once a month for however long it takes to convince a prosecutor, judge, or jury that you, in fact, did comply with the federal law and you are not criminally liable. So the federal law won't stop you from being arrested in these gun-unfriendly states. And in fact, New York, New Jersey um, seem to be sort of proud of the fact that they treat it as an affirmative defense, not as a bar to arrest. Yeah, and I'm glad you mentioned uh, New York. We had this question from, from Larry, can I carry an unloaded shotgun in my car in New York anymore? And going back to Emily's point exactly with this federal safe passage provision, that affirmative defense, just to reiterate, you know, it, it's not a bar to arrest. It's not a bar to getting dragged through the system. Um, it's something that you would have to raise at your trial and show, hey, I meet all these qualifications and therefore the law doesn't apply to me. And so we've even spoken to, I've spoken to police officers mm -hmm. who could lawfully carry in other states. You know, there, um, there's a lot of different things. We'll talk about that towards the end of the stream, but um, getting arrested for carrying in the, in the state of New York. So it's it's it can be very, very legally dicey. Now, the the you know, a lot of people don't travel by cars. We've got some RV questions. We're going to get to RVs in just a moment. Um, but I'd say the second most common is flying with a firearm. Yes. And a lot of people ask, you know, and a lot of people are scared to fly with their gun. They just, there's something instinct, you know, instinctive, you know, this feels wrong. I shouldn't be able yeah. to take a gun with me on a plane. And that's just not the case, is it? No, easier than you think. Yes. Um, in fact, I was shocked the first time I checked a firearm. Um, it is, you know, actually a really, now again, I guess there is a snag here, which is that um, the airline and the TSA, they're not going to forewarn you that the state that you're going to won't let you legally possess that firearm. So that's where people really get snagged up here. You still have to do your research ahead of time. You know, if you're a Texan and you're like, I'm flying to New York, the airport is not going to tell you and TSA is not no. going to tell you that you're going to get arrested when you hit the ground in New York. 
Um, so you really do still have to do your do your initial legwork here. But, um, you know, we are talking generally about hard sided locking cases, unloaded firearms. And, you know, check your airline, actually, because the airlines, some have slightly different requirements about exactly how they want your ammunition encased. Um, for example, some airlines want it to be in the original manufactured packaging you bought it in. So just call the airline ahead of time. Make sure you've got that ammunition stored away. Ammunition is going to go in that hard sided locking case. You're going to declare it at check in. I have found that it takes about an extra five minutes to check in with a firearm. I don't know if you've found the same. Yeah, it's about the same. Yeah. So it is quite easy. Um, and I will say, though, um, TSA approved locks do make your life easier because the TSA, you know, they might go inspect that firearm, make sure it truly is unloaded. If you've got the TSA approved lock, you don't have to be called back to open the box for them later. Um, it's just kind of a nice, you don't have to go through security twice. Um, and I'll say from personal experience, once from flying with shotguns, make sure that you've got that lock in every place you can put a lock on the case. If they can sort of pry the case open in any spot, they will call you back. They will not let you fly with that gun. Don't have your hard sided lock shotgun case with not a lock through every hole because the TSA might get on you. And so just as a practical like walkthrough as a as a gun owner, what it might look like, you know, you're transporting your everyday carry, your handgun. Uh, most handgun cases do not meet the minimum size requirements required by airline. So that's going to go inside of a larger mm -hmm. piece of checked luggage. So kind of the process that you would go through. You know, make sure there's no loose ammunition or anything like that in the bags that you're that you're going with. But, you know, you, ha you have your hard sided container, you know, your semi-automatic pistol unloaded, slide locked open, placed in the case, ammunition enclosed. Mm -hmm. You know, that could be it could be in the magazine, but the magazine would have to have a yeah. cover. Well, but again, check with your airline. Airline, airline again. Yeah. Yes. Um, but to avoid the civil. We'll talk about that. Oh, to avoid yes. the civil enforcement penalty, mm -hmm. the ammunition has to be enclosed and then your airlines may tack on those extra yes. things. But um, so could be in the same box, closed, locked up, or maybe you leave it unlocked, you know, for when you get to the airport, you go in, counter, hi, I'm flying with a firearm today. A lot of times you'll open it in their presence. Mm -hmm. If the slide's locked open, it's easy for them to visually see, hey, this firearm's unloaded. Locking it, going inside of your larger piece of checked luggage, goes on the carousel with all mm -hmm. the other bags. And depending on the airport that you're landing in, I've seen some where they do set your bags aside at the sure. end. And, or are they, you know, would be at your airline's counter at the where you pick up your bags oh, I've and seen, sometimes not yeah sometimes yeah. it just shows up on the carol with all the other you know carousel with all the other bags so it, i will say there is some variation between airports yeah absolutely um but you know generally speaking much easier than you would imagine um where you really get snagged up when you're trying to fly with a firearm is those people who don't declare it right you still have to declare it you can't just do all the steps right put it in the hard side of the lock case put it in your checked luggage you know, unload it, do everything right and not declare it because you will get a fine for that. Um, and then, of course, if you were to accidentally leave a firearm or ammunition in your um, carry on luggage, go through TSA security with it, that's going to be a problem. We probably don't even have time to discuss in this. Well, I, I'll, I will mention one thing, the fine. So if you if you accidentally carry on with a firearm or you don't declare mm -hmm. and it shows up in your bag, um, they do have civil enforcement through the TSA and those fines can go up to $13,910. Yes. So depending on what, what it is, if it's a singular piece of ammunition, they treat it different than a loaded firearm, different than, you know, something else. So just be very careful. That's a very, very expensive yeah. fine. And, um, you know, once you actually commit the offense, I mean, by the way, it is for the most part strict liability. So yeah. I didn't know that there was a firearm in my carry on bag isn't going to cut it for the civil fine portion. Um, and we are finding right now the federal government is taking upwards of two or three years to actually issue people those letters of civil fines. Yes. People are forgetting they even did this and they're getting slapped <laughs> with these nasty, nasty fines. Um, if you have done this recently, start saving now yeah. <laughs> because you've got a couple of years to put the money away. And then one thing, just to recap on the on the flying with the guns, I would say the most, you know, the, the procedure, very important, but the encompassing, and this this applies to all travel, where you start and where you land needs to be a place that you can yes. legally possess the firearm. And there's just a couple of hostile states that I would commit yeah. to memory. Well, you know. what happens if your flight gets diverted and you have to land in New Jersey or New York when that you happens. didn't think that you were going to have to? What would you yeah, suggest? So you need to refuse possession of your bags. Mm -hmm. You know, um, Let's say you get diverted to Chicago. 
You know, they are not a gun friendly state. They don't want you bringing your guns there. They don't recognize um, the city of Chicago is not going to want you to carry a loaded firearm around. So you refuse possession of your bags, whether it shows up on the carousel or whether it shows up next to your airline counter. You need to go let them know, hey, my flight was diverted. I have a firearm on bag. I'm refusing taking possession of my bag. I'd like this forwarded to my final destination because we have seen this happen um, where, you know, they the police are laying in wait. I yeah. mean, you think this this sounds scary. I mean, this happens. Police laying in wait to see, is this person going to take their bag with a gun in it? And if they do, bam, got them. Yeah. I would like you to forward my bag to my final. That's actually the only thing I'm going to say at <laughs> yes. all. I would like you to forward my bag to its final destination. I'm not going to take possession of it. And then, you know, go buy yourself a fresh set of underwear and deal with it <laughs> overnight. I mean, honestly, because it is not worth the hassle and the possible arrest. But going back to our, so you got to know, just like Emily was saying, our legal start, legal finish, commit those kind of gun hostile states to your memory, West Coast, Northeast, Illinois. Mm -hmm. Just know, you know, and, and a way to kind of avoid this is to get your license or permit to carry a handgun issued by your state. Um, it really opens up a lot of places that you could travel. It does. Still not those, you know, too far east, too far west. But, right. you know, ultimately, or northeast, I guess. But ultimately, yes, gosh, that license to carry really makes a huge difference. Okay. Oh, uh, yeah. I want to talk just very briefly, international travel with a firearm. Oh, gosh. Um, you know, this is such a huge bag that I think that we can just say generally if you are traveling internationally and you'd like to take your firearm with you, um, there are a couple steps you need to take both internally within the United States and then you need to be talking to the Department of State for whatever country you are headed to. Sometimes you're going to be allowed and sometimes you're not, but the hoops that you need to jump through, I would give yourself six to nine months to accomplish that process. Mm -hmm. um, I know that there's a form here in the United States you need to complete. Yeah, I want to say, oh, you're putting me on the spot. Oh, Customs sorry. and Border, Border Patrol 4457, maybe? I, that sounds right. Okay. <laughs> um, and then on top of that, of course, you can't just leave the country with a firearm. You need to be sure that you've gotten the proper authorization and pre-approval from that destination country, which again, you may or may not get. The Second Amendment does not apply outside the borders of the United States. And yeah. so, um, like I can tell you specifically, like flying to Costa Rica, it is illegal to even import pepper spray into Costa Rica with you. So they are not going to let you come in with a gun except under very, very unusual circumstances. Whereas maybe Canada, you've got some hunting exceptions for long guns, yep. a little bit easier, quicker to do, but you really do need to do that legwork or speak to an attorney and get that process started and early. That, that, I mean, I get that call frequently and it cracks me up every time is, you know, I'm on my way to Mexico, mm -hmm. you know, how do I carry my gun? And and I hate to be the bearer of bad news, you know, unless you're meeting one of these exceptions or following the proper protocols, you're not going to be legally taking your firearm to Mexico. And they, I always get the surprised yeah. reaction of, but it's really dangerous in Mexico, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. No, it absolutely However, is. <laughs> um, we have gotten enough calls from, um, I mean, the American consulate from American citizens being detained for having done just that. Yep. Um, it is very serious business. So let's talk about um, some other modalities of transportation, mm -hmm. right? So we've kind of covered cars, covered planes, um, and we got a question here. So we have David asks, or no, I'm sorry, we have Lewis asks, can you travel with your handgun on a Greyhound bus? So this is an interesting question, and this is just my understanding of Greyhound's corporate policy because they are private companies. Private mm -hmm. companies get to make their own decisions about whether or not they will allow you to have a firearm. My understanding is Greyhound buses will not allow you to have a firearm either on the bus itself or in your baggage that has been stowed under the bus. Mm -hmm. um, why are they allowed to do that? Well, Again, they can just say, if you don't like it, don't use our service. Same with cruise lines, right? right. Cruise lines are not going to let you take firearms with you. Um, that is just private corporations getting to say, we make the rules. If you don't like it, don't patronize our company. And the same thing with, and this comes up, Amtrak, you know, mm -hmm. that's a government funded train, you know, talking mm -hmm. about different ways of transporting firearms. Those are going to follow very similar to the TSA rules. Yes. Amtrak actually is very, almost identical to the flying with firearms rules. And then your comer your passenger trains within a state, you know, we have a few small train authorities, example here in Texas, other states have the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, it's going to depend on the law in your state. Um, you know, Texas, for example, preemption, you know, the government isn't allowed to exclude firearms from certain places. And so we follow that rule and we see that happen or pop up from time to time in other um, in other states as well. You know, we see these restrictions on local governments, local authorities, train authority. 
And so if you would be allowed to maybe carry on a bus, you could probably think a local passenger train, probably okay. But again, you're going to have to look at the law in the state specifically, not licensed everywhere. So it can't tell you specifics, mm -hmm. but you're going to be following the law of your state. Yeah. So we have um, a question that came up last time that I think it's probably time to address here. How does traveling in an RV make a difference oh, in yeah. terms of traveling with your firearm? Do you want to start that oh, one Oh, yeah. Out? No, I'll tell you. We have about 10 different RV Ten different RV questions. I'll give y'all give y'all some shout outs, um, and it's going to depend. So we're going back to how is your vehicle being used at the time, right? Because an RV is not it's not a straightforward answer. Mm -hmm. Now we're going to follow when we're using it like a car, you know, like a transportation vehicle. It's going to be treated like a transportation vehicle mm -hmm. generally. Oh, absolutely. When you are in motion, that RV is your car, right? Not necessarily your home for all, not just firearms, all sorts of purposes under the law. And so, for all those rules that we've spoken about thus far, I mean, those are the laws that are going to apply. You know, do they have constitutional carry, or do they have some form of you can carry a loaded concealed firearm without a license or mm -hmm. permit? Do they have reciprocity with your state? And if they do, you know. Could you carry in accordance with their state law? So assuming that you're either qualified under their state's law or they share reciprocity, well, then you could carry according to that state law. But then we have this kind of extra, you know, kind of hiccup. And I understand the instinct because we have Castle Doctrine. You know, what happens when I start using that RV as my dwelling or my, you know, my habitation? Does that change anything? It does. And now, of course, you have to be sure the state you're in would consider that RV your dwelling or habitation or home under their version of the Castle Doctrine, but most will. And so at that point, I mean, because there are lots of states, I mean, sure, we've got lots like Texas that would say, you know, both your occupied dwelling and your occupied vehicle, and then sometimes even your occupied business um, are your castles for these purposes. But we have lots of states that actually really do ultra restrict it to just your dwelling. Right. So let's assume you're in one of those states, you've ceased traveling, you're no longer using that RV as a motor vehicle. How do we know that? It's going to be fact dependent. It's going to be very situational. Things like, um, are you, you know, stopping for the night? Is it, is it, you know, evening time? Are you clearly stopped for the night? Are you hooked up to, you know, your what you need to be hooked up for for your RV to stay overnight? Are you, um, you know, are you clearly, you know, your actions manifesting the intent that you are now using this as a dwelling rather than as a vehicle? And if the answer is yes, and particularly you're in one of those states that says your occupied vehicle isn't your castle, then you should get those castle doctrine perks should someone try to forcefully and unlawfully enter or commit a forcible felony or whatever the state's law says your castle doctrine qualification is right there, which is great. Not only castle doctrine, but um, one of the things I like a lot about an RV going from a vehicle to a dwelling is when that RV is a vehicle, well, it falls under the vehicle exception to search warrants, right? Right. This that's is, another big one. Yeah. And this is one of these things that I think a lot of people don't realize, but that's that if you are in your vehicle, an officer does not have to obtain a search warrant to search that vehicle, which is crazy. It's just this overarching exception that we have in the law. As long as the officer can articulate probable cause as to why he needs to search that vehicle for evidence of a crime, right. then we get to search the vehicle without a warrant. Whereas if that RV is stopped, if you're hooked up, if it's obviously your home, right? Not we have a higher expectation of privacy. Higher expectation of privacy. There, uh, you know, except for others, very rare exceptions like you know an immediate danger to human life, fleeing felons, things like that. If he wants to search that RV and you're using it as your home, he's got to go get a warrant, and yep. that makes a huge difference. Just for, you know, I mean, for those Fourth Amendment absolutists of us out there who you know sort of don't touch my stuff. Um, that's a big difference. All right. So we're running, we got about six minutes left of time. And so I'm going to, we're going to rapid fire some questions so we can get to um, some of these questions. Uh, M, M underscore one M asks, what about traveling in a private jet? So, and I'll answer this one. If you're staying within a state, you know, it's treated just kind of like a car. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you're staying within a state in your private jet, you know, then you should be able to carry generally the same way that you would um, is if you were driving your car around, the things to look out for though, um, some of these airports, if you're having to go through security, you know, that may change the, the calculation a little bit, but if you're on a private airstrip, municipal airstrip, um, not going past some kind of federal security, yeah. uh, then it probably makes it easier. Sure. And if your carry license is recognized in the state you take off in, in that private jet and yep. in the state you land in, in that private jet, I mean, yeah, just you 
carry on, carry on board, no issues there. So Reggie asks, what about traveling or driving, stopping at a rest stop that receives federal funding? Um, and I think this is worth noting. It, it's going to depend on what agency is maintaining it. Uh, but we, we see a lot of these you know, federal-ish stops are net run by the National Park Service. And so for our national parks, we know if you'd be allowed to carry under state law, then generally you'd be allowed to carry into the national park, not inside the facilities, not mm -hmm. inside the buildings, but if you were camping or if you were inside of your vehicle. And then these funding, you know, if it's just being funded, if it's not owned or leased by the federal government, then it's probably just going to be a state building. Do you have yeah, to... no, that's a great explanation. So a uh, question from, um, from David asks, how about retired law enforcement? This came up in a previous stream, um, and I think this is a good you know, we do have a lot of former law enforcement officers and current law enforcement officers. What about traveling? Uh, you know, how is their, you know, Texas, we call it their TCOL, their license. Mm -hmm. How are those treated in another state? Yeah. So LEOSA, which is the federal law that allows um, peace officers, both active duty and retired, to carry um, and to their right to carry to be recognized yeah. in all 50 states. It's not the closest thing we have to national reciprocity, but of course it only applies to active duty and honorably retired peace officers. Now the rules do differ between active duty and honorably retired um, in terms of where they get to carry. So, you know, I'll just say, and there, there are, I mean, this is an entire topic in and of itself, yeah. but he, um, David specifically men mentioned retired. Mm -hmm. So I will say retired, your big thing to look out for when you are qualified to carry an early so you've got your card, you've got, got all your photo your, ID, you got, yep, your... got all your ducks in a row, is that if you are retired law enforcement, you still have to respect all of the no trespassing signs and the trespass ordinances for firearms within the state you're traveling to, whereas active duty peace officers actually may not have to. So, And the, the one thing I'll add to it as well is the affirmative defense, just like what we talked about mm -hmm. with, you know, safe passage provision, LEOSA, you know, and sometimes you hear it online called HB 218, you know, if, if that's what you're talking about, they, a lot of these states treat it as an affirmative defense. So the, I- Not only that, a lot of law enforcement officers don't really know how it works, how to enforce it. Yeah. I mean, you, I think you have personal experience with this. I do. I actually had a prosecutor call me once. He was working intake and he said, hey, I've got one of my police officers. He's got a Florida police officer detained in the back of his car. And this was before Texas had constitutional carry. Right. Um, he said, the guy has no carry license, but he says he's carrying under this goofy 218 thing. And we don't really know what's going on. Do I have probable cause for unlawful carry? And I was like, no, get that guy out of the back of your car. Um, and I won't mention the county or the person because they're probably not supposed to be calling defense attorneys for advice on this. But right. this is what we do. Right. right. Um, but I mean, it really is. I mean, that was a police officer in one of the biggest cities in the country yep. and a prosecutor in one of the biggest counties in the country who had no idea the existence of this law and without a resource could have just arrested this Florida peace officer. And, you know, we had a, a client who was a Texas peace officer arrested in the state of New York mm -hmm. um, because they said, you know, New York is one of those states that do not recognize any other state's license or permit to carry a handgun. And so, you know, I can see a cop on the beat. It's a safe assumption. If you have another person saying, hey, this is recognized by the state of New York, well, they know they have their blanket rule. We don't recognize anyone. Um, and that ended up, I think, ended up getting dismissed prior to going to trial. But it is very probable that could have gone to trial and they would have had to raise that defense at trial, just like safe passage. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, so we have, uh, <laughs> I'm not going to read this name because it's hilarious, but what about uh we're talking about semi trucks mm -hmm. and so this this does come up we talked to quite a few truck drivers um truck carry there's not going to be a federal law saying you can't you know keep firearms or ammunition inside of your vehicle and so you're going to be following generally the, generally the law of the state that you're located in um and you know with the exception of there are some places where a lot of truck drivers travel that are off limits can you give us a few examples of those like a oh, um, military installations, military installations, yeah, yes. ports, you know, just you, you're following the law of the state that you're located in. Be careful because you are going to be possibly going to some areas that you know don't allow firearms. And then you have employer considerations when you say. Absolutely. Your employer can still give you the thumbs up or thumbs down regardless, but there's no overarching federal law that carries, you know, that covers your personal carry weapon for self-defense in the cab of your truck. Right. Um, so it really is just, I mean, you could pretend as though you were just taking a very long road trip personally <laughs> and follow those same rules. I think that bleeds quickly into one of our sort of 
prior questions before we started this was, what about traveling with guns for work? Right. Um, again, you know, your employer, although can always give you the thumbs up, thumbs down um, in terms of I'll fire you if you carry while you're on this work trip. Um, you know, generally speaking, with some very few exceptions, they can do that. Um, treat those trips as though they're private trips. Yeah. And, you know, and, and most states are at will employment states. Mm -hmm. An employer can hire and fire people for any legal reason, you know, not your race, not your religion, age, right. something like that. But, you know, being an advocate of the Second Amendment, not so much. And so um, just know, while it may not be criminal, to Emily's point, um, it could cost you your job. But I think that brings us to the end of our discussion. But don't uh, don't stop leaving comments because this is where we source future discussions. Mm -hmm. And that's why we're talking about traveling today because of so many traveling questions. So make sure to continue to leave questions so that we can talk about this in the future. And again, you know, we, we did have to kind of dance around all these states, different laws. We don't know every state's law, but thankfully there is a resource for y'all in the comment section. Uh, the Traveler Guide for Gun Owners. We have all those states. They have some really, really helpful information in it, you know, if you're if you plan on going on vacation. Yeah. So make sure to check those out. And US Allship members can always call into the business line. Right. Tell, you know, tell member services that you are traveling to another state. This is where I'm going. I need to talk to an attorney in that state to talk yep. me through what I'm gonna do. And that is open to members as well, which is a very helpful resource. So make sure, leave your comments, check out those resources, leave a like, subscribe. And we will see y'all next time. On behalf of myself, Emily Taylor, thank you so much for your time. Thank you.